the Rye Harrison group, the Mary Noel group, and the Leonard Park group, which he still maintains a membership. And he's been in this program of Alcoholics Anonymous since 1962. In 1978, he wrote the screenplay to the most famous movie about Alcoholics Anonymous, My Name is Bill. And in 1989, finally got that film made. And to us, it's a classic. It's like The Godfather. He's <laughs> got over 40 years in the program, but you wouldn't know it by talking to him. Last <laughs> Let me rephrase that. <laughs> Bill is a very humble man. <laughs> the last time I saw Bill, he was uh, serving dinner to terminal cancer patients at Calvary Hospital. And he's here with his family this morning, and it's my privilege to introduce you to Bill Borchard. Wow. Hi, I'm Bill, and I'm an alcoholic. And I'm sober today, this morning, through the grace of God, the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous, and all of you who have taught me how to stay away from one drink one day at a time. And I thank you for that. And how do you stand up here and follow the, uh, the police pipers? <laughs> Bill Wilson, reading how it works. Tim Martin, describing my sponsor. And, uh, and me facing all of you who, uh, so many of you I've known for so long, who have helped me stay sober. Um, I am very nervous and I am very filled emotionally, so if I uh, shed a tear, hope you'll forgive me. If you don't, the hell with you. So, uh, <laughs> um, I want to thank Tim and I want to thank the Mamaronek group for asking me to what a special privilege this is. I also want to thank another gentleman who uh, perhaps some of you don't know, but many of you do know, who was instrumental in helping this Unity Breakfast get started, and that's a great guy named Ray O'Keefe. Uh, yes, he deserves it, yeah. Um, Ray hasn't been feeling too good these days, so I also would like to ask you to say a special prayer for Ray. Okay. Um, I noticed on the ticket it said that I'm from North Carolina. Um, well, my southern accent is actually South Brooklyn, you know, it's a, uh, and I actually live in South Carolina, a place called Little River. So that's where we spend most of our time. Uh, these days, but I also uh, have a place in Peekskill, and I am a proud member of the Leonard Park Group, which happens to be the greatest AA group in the world. <laughs> and, um, well, if you don't think your group is the greatest AA group in the world, find another group, you know. Um, but I'd also, love, also like to thank all the members of Leonard Park who are here today to support me. Um, I'm thinking back to uh, my sponsor. Um, I, I asked him uh, once why people get invited to speak at AA meetings. And he said that's so that they can stand up there and we can all sit out here and take their inventory, you know. <laughs> and, uh, well, that's what I used to do. You know, I would sit at the open meetings and, and look at whoever was speaking and uh, and just... You know, in my mind, I, I knew them perfectly well as soon as they opened their mouth. Um, just like you know me perfectly well since I've opened my mouth. But um, he also uh, he also said that um, we're supposed to practice humility in Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, in fact, in London Park, we're very strong on humility and sobriety. So then why does people put somebody like me up on a podium <laughs> and people like Tim Martin say such nice things. Um, but anyway, I'm not worried because my sponsor also said I had so much humility, I was proud of it. So, uh, <laughs> uh, 
which is pretty much true. And then, of course, just when I began to think that this was today was all about me, I happened to call my friend Sonny, my sponsee, Sonny. If you don't know Sonny, and you don't believe miracles happen in Alcoholics Anonymous, <laughs> go see Sonny. And I said, Sonny, you mean you're going to pay $25 to come and hear me speak? He said, I go there every year and pay $25 no matter who's speaking, you know. So, <laughs> so it's not all about me. It's all about Alcoholics Anonymous. And it's all about sobriety. And, um, and I'm so very grateful to be a member of Alcoholics Anonymous and to have been, so, been sober for a number of 24 hours. Uh, so I'm going to share now with you what it used to be like, what happened, and what it's like now, as best I can. Um, I come from a family of alcoholics. Uh, it was on both sides of my family. Uh, my father had six brothers, and five of them, including my dad, were alcoholics. Um, and I remember the, that very vividly. You know, wherever I went visiting in the family, uh, alcoholism was on display. Um, and on my other side, my, uh, my mother's side of the family, my grandfather was an alcoholic, my grandmother was an alcoholic, my uncle was an alcoholic, on and on and on. But you know, nobody in my family on either side ever called anybody an alcoholic. You know, um, they, they just, the word was never used. The only time I ever heard the word used was when I'd be riding in a car and uh, my mother or father would point at somebody who was sitting on a curb picking lint out of their navel and say, that's an alcoholic. And so in my mind, an alcoholic was a Bowery Derly, someone who had gone all the way down with this disease. Uh, I never thought my Uncle Freddy was an alcoholic, you know. I mean, even though every time we went to visit him and he and my father would get drunk, he'd take out his fiddle to play. And Uncle Freddie never took any lessons to play a fiddle. <laughs> and my Aunt Catherine would say to him, Freddie, if you take out that fiddle, it's going to take a long, big enemy to get it out from where I'm going to stick it, you know. <laughs> but he'd play anyway, and uh, then there'd be hell to pay. Anyway, that's, that's the way it was in my family. Uh, my father, as I say, was, a, was an alcoholic. And as a kid, I remember uh, the times that when he wouldn't come home, I'd get this terrible feeling in the pit of my stomach because I knew what was going to happen when he did come home. My mother would usually lock the doors if he hadn't been home for a day or so, and then my father would break into his own house. <laughs> and my mother would get out the kitchen knife, and she'd start chasing him around the dining room table with the kitchen knife, screaming at my father to stop. And my father was drunk, but he wasn't stupid, so he kept running, you know. But these weren't the things that made me an alcoholic. Um, Paul and I were talking before the meeting that it runs in both of our families. He has sons in Alcoholics Anonymous, and, and I do too, which I think is a wonderful thing for them because I know what it has done for me in my life. But I didn't, I didn't think about it at the time. Anyway, that's the kind of family I grew up in, you know. When we go to a funeral and the bottle came out, you didn't know whether they were going to bury one or six, you know. Um, Christmas was teared down a tree night. Um, I mean, it was a very exciting family to grow up in. Now, I went away when I was a young man. I was 13 years old. I went away to a seminary because I thought... I had a vocation to be a missionary priest. And I guess the world is very thankful today that someone changed my mind. Um, but at that time, looking back at it, I've, I've always been a guy who had a low self-esteem and an enormous ego. Um, we alcoholics are complicated people. Um, that's why they say it's a simple program for complicated people. But anyway, I, I, I don't know whether I went away to get out of the house or whether uh, Sister Alice Marie talked me into it. <laughs> she was the uh, 
the principal at our at our school, or what? Or, but I thought it was exciting. I had read a book about a, a priest who was killed by Chinese bandits, and he was a hero to me, and that was probably one of the reasons. So anyway, I went away to the seminary. And uh, in my mind, I was going to become a priest. I was going to go to China see, and save all the Chinese, you know, um, as if they needed saving. Anyway, <laughs> after four and a half years, my spiritual director sat me down. Actually, he, he met with the whole class one at a time, and, and he spent about an hour or so with each seminarian and me. He spent about ten minutes. The first nine minutes, he talked about the weather. And then he looked at me and he said, um, you know, William, I think one of these days you might make a wonderful father, but not in this place. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I left the Marinol Seminary and I came out into the world. In the seminary they refer to this as the world because this is where all the gals are. You know, there were no gals behind the, the wall, you know. And um, so I came out and, and, and I got to tell you, having grown up, and, and so many of you have shared this with me, and it really helped me identify um, my disease. That as I was growing up, I also felt, I always felt uncomfortable, ill at ease, like I didn't quite measure up. I always felt different. I had all these mixed up feelings inside of me. And, um, and now I'm away from the guys in the neighborhood for four and a half years. I come back, and I'm really now a stick in the mud, you know? I'd see a girl, and I'd blush. Well, it didn't last that long, but for a while, you know. And I got a job, <clears throat> I continued my education, I went to St. John's University, and, and I got a job working for a newspaper in New York. <coughs> Some of you who have the same color hair I have might remember the New York Journal American, which was then the flagship of the Hearst newspaper organization. This was in 1952-53, and uh, it was the heyday of journalism. There were 17 newspapers at that time in the city of New York, believe it or not. 17. Long Island Press, uh, Bronx Home News. What are you shaking your head for, Lenny? You're too young to remember that. Um, Brooklyn Eagle, on and on and on. Anyway, um, this is the New York Journal American. And I became a copy boy, you know, where you run coffee for writers. And um, I, I un uncovered a story. Um, I was going to St. John's at nights, working during the day. And to make a long story short, this was the, the days of uh, William O'Dwyer, if anybody studied about him in the history books. He was one of the more crooked mayors of New York City. And he had a fire commissioner who used to go around, uh, you know, holding up, building people, um, shaking them down. You remember that, Jack? <laughs> yeah. Um, I think you represented a few of them, didn't you, Jack? Yeah. Uh, um, anyway, um, in my ethics class one night at St. John's University, I noticed this elderly guy sitting in the back of my class, and after class I asked the professor who he was. And he says, that's James J. Moran, the former fire commissioner of New York City, who has been arrested for um, uh, stealing city funds, and he's under 99 counts of, uh, of thievery, and uh, he's awaiting trial. And I thought it was quite interesting that he was also studying ethics at St. John's University, you know. <laughs> So the next day I told my city editor, and they literally stopped the presses and big red headline. That was the lead story for the day. And that afternoon, my city editor called me over and he said, uh, we're making you a newspaper reporter. I was 18 and a half years old, wet behind the ears, scared to death, and didn't know what the hell it meant to be a newspaper reporter. But I had a, he said I had a nose for news. So they sent me over to Brooklyn, Brooklyn, where I was born to be a, a police reporter on what they call the lobster shift. That's midnight to 9 o'clock in the morning, which is when everything happens in Brooklyn anyway. So, it was a, you know. And uh, I said to the city, well, what do I do? He said, when you get over there, ask the other reporters, and they'll break you in. That's the way you learned the job back then. So, uh, in fact, that's the way you learn a lot of jobs yet. So, uh, I've got to put this here. So anyway, I went over there, and I walked into Brooklyn Police Headquarters, and I went up to the lieutenant on the desk, and I said, where can I find some of the other reporters? And he pointed across Flatbush Avenue to the Edison Bar and Grill, and he said, you'll find some of them in there. Well, he was wrong. I found all of them in there, you know. <laughs> and that's where I began my illustrious career, 
Not as a newspaper man, but as an alcoholic. <laughs> Of course, I went across Flatbush Avenue, I walked into the bar, and I asked the bartender to introduce me to one of the reporters, and uh, he introduced me to a guy from the Daily Mirror, and he bought me a drink, told me what he did, he introduced me to a reporter for the Daily News, bought me a drink, told me what he did, he passed me to the reporter for the news, they passed me down the bar. Most of these guys were 50, maybe 50, 60 years old, much older than myself, and um, Anyway, I walked into the Edison Bar and Grill about midnight, and I walked out at 4.30 in the morning, a veteran newsman, <laughs> because that's what alcohol did for me. Now, you laugh, but you know about your first drink, right? Your first drunk and what it did. It's the magic elixir. Looking back at it, and I can still think, think about it and remember it to this day, it made me feel like I always wanted to feel. It made me feel comfortable. It made me feel at ease. It made me feel grown up. It made me feel smarter. It made me feel the way I had never felt before. And I wanted to hang on to it. And I didn't have a hangover that next morning. Because I just, you know, continued on. And from that point on, before I did anything else in my life, I had a few drinks to get ready. I was always getting ready by having a few drinks. No matter where I went, what I did, I had to have a few drinks to get ready. I didn't think about it. I mean, it just was, became part of my life, part of my life. I have to tell you that, you know, when you're, when you're young, I was, as I say, 18 and a half at that time, and you're fairly good health, you know, it takes a while for this disease to work on you. But it, it does. It, 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 began, it began to work on me mentally because, as I say, it began, I began to rely on alcohol. It became my friend. I worked for the New York Journal American for eight and a half years. I went from a police reporter to covering city halls to covering the criminal courts. Then they found out I could write. They brought me in on rewrite. They thought I, then they found out I could write, so I was on day rewrite. And when I was 21 years old, they made me a byline feature writer for the largest evening newspaper in the world. And that's a fact. And when I was 24 years old, I was the obituary editor for the largest evening newspaper in the world. <laughs> And there's a little bit of a difference between being a byline feature writer and being an obituary editor, you know? As a byline feature writer, I went around the country, covered major stories. I mean, I mean, a fantastic story. Uh, like the last, last execution at Sing Sing Prison, the first Sputnik shot into space, authoring Lucy being thrown out of the University of Alabama by George Wallace, and on and on and on. But my drinking began to get worse and worse and worse. Or better and better and better, however you want to look at it. Um... And so I began to get fired. I began to get fired for various reasons, you know. I began, the first time I got fired is because um, I, a friend of mine who was a fellow alcoholic, Jimmy Helian, who my wife hated. <clears throat> anyway, um, uh, we, 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 bought, we couldn't get our car started one night, so we borrowed a General American delivery truck to go down to a bar in Greenwich Village, you know. And the driver's union complained, so they fired me. Anyway, but then they rehired me. And then I got fired again for being drunk on the job. What happened was I was sent to cover a five-alarm fire in a Brooklyn Navy yard. And um, they found me in a bar. And they had about ten numbers for me at the city desk. And um, the first nine were bars. The last one was my home. Um, and they usually got me at the first nine. <laughs> and so I jumped in the car with a six-pack and a bottle, and I headed down Atlantic Avenue for the Brooklyn Navy Yard. And um, it was a beautiful summer evening, and soft music playing on the radio, and I'm swigging and sipping and swigging and sipping, like Don Cassini, sipping and dipping. Anyway, um, I forgot that at Bedford, the, the, the Long Island Railroad that runs overhead on Atlantic Avenue, it goes back down underground and becomes a subway. I forgot. 70 miles an hour into a cement stanchion. I come to a Jewish hospital in Brooklyn, and I got this big rubber thing in my mouth because I had spit out part of my tongue. My teeth had come through my lip. I busted six ribs, and they were putting me back together. And, and I remember one doctor, they were about to stitch up my tongue and wire up my jaw because I had a fractured jaw. He lifted my eyelid. You know, you remember, you remember when you come out of blackouts. And he said, we think we ought to give him some anesthesia. And the guy looked in my eye and he says, this bum don't need a thing, you know. <laughs> so, uh, 
When I got out of the hospital, I, I, I came back to my mother and dad's house because this big shot newspaper reporter couldn't afford his own place. But anyway, and, and my father uh, invited all of our friends to visit me at the house. You know how alcoholics love to visit the sick and bury the dead as long as there's a bottle around, right? <laughs> and there were about a dozen guys in the living room. My father's passing the bottle. But when it comes to me, he grabs the bottle. And he says, you can't have any of that hard stuff. You know, you've got a wired-up jaw and a, white, and a stitched-up tongue. So he hands me a bottle of Christian Brothers Sherry Wine. I never will forget it. And he says, this could ease the pain. So I began to clog this Christian Brothers Sherry Wine, you know. And if you clog enough of it, you can get pretty drunk. And it's so sweet, clog enough, you get pretty sick. And if you ever try to puke through a wired-up jaw, you know, as I often say, the big pieces come out of your ears, you know. And you, So, so I swore off Christian Brothers Sherry Wine, and I, and I continued on. In the meantime, um, my love life now is beginning to, uh, you know, heat up. Um, yeah, you, you, know, you know, the kind of doozies you find sitting next to you on a bar stool when you come out of a blackout. But anyway, that's, I, don't mean, I don't mean that. I, I got engaged a couple of times, you know. Um, in fact, I got engaged to this gal. Um, I was drinking with her brother one night in a bar in Queens, and her brother says, you ought to meet my sister. I said, okay, I'll meet your sister. So he introduces me to his sister, and she seemed like a nice girl, and my mother liked her a lot. In fact, my mother liked her so much, I found out I, I, I wound up getting engaged to this girl. You know, now I didn't love her. In fact, I liked her brother better, you know, but... Uh... <laughs> no, Sonny, not that way. No, 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 no. Um, but now I'm engaged to this girl, and, and, and what the hell am I going to do? You know, I was stuck. What do you do? Plus, the father was a police captain, and he carried a gun, you know. <laughs> Plus, he put $1,500 down on the hall. I mean, he wanted to get her out the door, you know. So, uh, so what do you do? Anyway, I'm thinking, thinking, thinking. Anyway, the opportunity came along one Saturday. We were invited to an afternoon wedding in New Jersey, and this gal... And she was, don't get me wrong, this was a nice, nice girl. She was. And um, I think, anyway, she was. She was a nice girl. And I'm, a, I'm an egotistical, arrogant, self-centered, as B is what I am. And I am. I was. I was. I, I um, hope I'm not as much anymore, but I was. It, it was all about Bill. Anyway, she said to me, don't drink so much, you know, because she, she always knew it. And um, I said, don't worry about it. She said, there'll be plenty at the wedding. She said, I'll pick you up at 10 o'clock when you get off. So I was, I was working in Manhattan Police Headquarters at the time, Elizabeth Street. And um, so 10 o'clock, she arrives with, to pick me up. And I'm three sheets to the wind. <laughs> I'm ready for this wedding, you know. So um, get in the car. And, and she had a friend of hers in the back seat named Frances, a beautiful, beautiful-looking girl, all by herself, you know. And... Uh, and I found out that Frances was also engaged, but her boyfriend was on, in the army stationed in Frankfurt, Germany. So Frances looked kind of lonely, you know. And I always felt it was a mortal sin for good-looking girls to look lonely, you know. So I figured I'd do something about it. <laughs> so we began to talk. And when we got to New Jersey, I found out that Frances loved to drink like I drank. Man, we drank up a storm and... And she was constantly pulling me on a dance floor, and my fiancé was yelling at me for, you know, making a fool out of her and all this kind of stuff. And I remember bits and pieces of it, you know, when I put it together later on. <laughs> um, but the next thing I remember is I came out of a blackout, and I was in a German dance hall on Fresh Pond Road in Queens. And there was this big oompa band playing, oompa, oompa, you know. And, and I'm in the middle of the dance floor, and there's a big crowd circling around us, you know, clapping their hands. And I'm in the floor dancing with Frances. And Frances is twirling her jacket in the air, and she throws her jacket in the air, and I thought that was part of the dance. I took off my jacket, and I twirled it, and I threw it in the air. Frances takes off her, her blouse, and she throws it up in the air, and I took off my shirt and tie, and I threw it up in the air. And, and they crowd, the, the band is playing louder and louder, and the people are clapping, you know. It's really exciting, you know. So she, un, she takes her skirt off, and she throws it up in the air. So I dropped my drawers, you know. <laughs> and all of a sudden, my engagement ring comes flying in over the crowd, you know. Yeah. 
she broke it off. <laughs> oh, man. Anyway, um, I pick up my ring, put my pants back on, and I get dressed. <laughs> and I go over to one of my favorite haunts in Queens, another bar and dance hall, to show my friends I'm a free man, you know, because they were worried about me, you know. <laughs> Uh, you know how we drinking buddies are. We hang, we we hang together, right? Oh yeah. yeah. So I'm I'm praying and showing my ring, and and then I decide I want to dance because I felt so good, you know. So I go into the back room where the dance hall is, and there were two beautiful girls sitting at the table, and uh, and and my wife remembers this better than I do. She said I went eeny meeny miny mo, <laughs> and I asked this lovely, lovely auburn haired girl to dance with me. And uh, three and a half weeks later, we danced off to Elton, Maryland, and got married. <laughs> and believe it or not, that Bernadette, my wife, uh, uh, we just were married 50 years in March, you know? Yeah. 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 But, uh, you know, they, well, they say, you know, some marriages are made in heaven. When she found out some marriages are made somewhere else, you know? <laughs> And uh, anyway, um, that's the way it happened, you know. And um, there was just something about Bernadette, and there is something about Bernadette. Um, I just didn't want to be with anybody else. I didn't know what love was. I had no idea, except this is the guy I loved, but there was something special. So anyway, we went down to Elton, Maryland. We got down there, and she said that she was hungry, so I went into town. I bought her an eight-cent loaf of Wonder Bread and a half a pound of bologna. And I bought a quarter for roses for myself. And that's how we started off our happily married bliss. We uh, moved into a furnished apartment that had a bed with a broken spring in the middle of the mattress. And it stu stu stood up right in the middle of the mattress, you know. So we both slept on one side and we began to have a family pretty quickly, you know. So. Uh, I should tell you that when I came into Alcoholics Anonymous, we had four children, and then I got sober, and we had five more. Yeah, because a lot of things begin to work again when you sober up, you know. <laughs> you know. So uh, anyway, um, <clears throat> and they still do. If you don't believe me, ask Mrs. Viagra, you know. So uh, um, anyway, where the hell am I going with this? Um, well, I'm telling you what it used to be like, you know. And there's anybody here, you know, um, that doesn't know much about this disease or about alcoholism or about alcoholics. You know, and I'm going to get into some painful stuff, and I'm going to still laugh because it's gone. It's yesterday's newspaper, you know. And, and today I'm sober and I'm happy, and, and, uh, and that's the way this thing works, you know. So I'm not laughing at hurting people or any of that kind of, I'm really not. It's... it's um, it's just that today I'm a relatively happy man most of the time because I'm a sober man and uh, I don't do those things much anymore. I don't lie as much as I used to, you know. I don't do a lot of the things as much as I used to. Anyway, um, so we began to have a family and, um, and, and I'm working at this paper and I'm getting fired and fired and fired. As I say, I wound up as the obituary editor. You know, that's the guy. See... What I want to share this morning is how this disease of alcoholism invaded every aspect of my life. It did not leave any stone unturned in my life, nor in your lives. And if you continue, if, if I, as I continue to drink, it only got worse. And if you continue to drink, it will only get worse. It's a progressive disease, and it is a disease, without a doubt. And it began to get worse in my life. And um, I gave up everything in my life that was near and dear to me for another drink. Now, if you had told me that when I was drinking, I wouldn't have agreed with you. But I drank up, gave up this wonderful job. I had a great career going for me in the newspaper business. I had a wonderful wife and family. We, had a, we bought a lovely home and um, after a while uh, and um, drank it all up. Anyway, um, so, so, as I said, I wound up as the obituary editor, and that, that's um, the guy that you come in at 3 o'clock in the morning, you sit under a light in the, what they call the Sunday department, all by yourself, 
And he's supposed to call up funeral homes to find out what well-known people dropped dead that night, you know, and then write their obituary editor. Well, by this time in my drinking career, you know, I would much rather spend the evening with Frank Mucci over at Mucci's Saloon, which was one of my favorite haunts. I had a lot of great bars that I drank in. Mucci's, the Rain House, Cuckoo's, Tootie's, you know, all very high-class places, you know. In fact, Mucci's was one of my, my favorites because at, at um, high tide, it was right on the East River, and at high tide, the river would flood the basement and would back up the toilets, and it would smell like hell, and I felt very comfortable being there, you know. <laughs> um, anyway, the Rain House, they had spittoons at the bar, which nobody spit in. It was like a shortcut to the men's room, you know. It is, but these were great places, you know. I have to have an announcement. S-U-B-R-U? Subaru. Oh. <laughs> You're right, Tim. You never knew I was sober 40 years, right? Yes. New York plates, B-A-B-8334. Please move your car right away. Hey, that's my car. Oh. No, it's not. No, it's not. Anyway... Thank you. Let's see, where was I? I was in a rain house, wasn't I, Jack? Yeah. So anyway, um, as the obituary editor, I was too busy to write to call a funeral home, so I said, tear the obituaries out of other newspapers and paste them up. And this is before the days of, uh, of um, computerized, you know, typesetting. They had, they had a line of type operators, you know, back then. And so I'd send them in, and, and they would print them. And then I was getting notes in my box from the city editor saying, we want fresh obits. Meaning, you know, people had died, you know, like last night or at least yesterday morning, you know. And, um, and when I went, when I sent one through, I forgot I made a mistake. I didn't read it very carefully. I was drunk, and the guy died two weeks ago. So uh, I knew I was going to get fired again, so instead I quit. And I got a job working for a magazine. And uh, so now I was traveling all over the country. I was interviewing famous people. I remember, I remember one, one occasion I was chasing Gregory Peck through old Idlewild Airport, which is now JFK. He had just uh, married some French girl he, he, they found him in a bathtub with or something. Anyway, um, I went out to Tulsa, Oklahoma to interview Ali Reynolds, who was a, at that time he was just retired as Paul. Remember, he was a great brief pitcher for the New York Yankees. And he had bought a mud company in Tulsa. And I went to Tulsa to interview him. And um, I arrived in Tulsa on October 18th, 1958. Now, why do I remember that date? Because that's the date that Oklahoma went wet. I mean, I had somebody in my corner, you know. So, uh, and I stayed at the Mayo Hotel. Stayed in the Mayo Hotel. Everybody was having a party. They're celebrating, you know, just getting drunk. And I did too. And three days later, I wound up at the New Albany Hotel on the other side of Tulsa, which is a flea bag joint. Never interviewed Reynolds. Never did, you know. And, uh, but they, they, they kept me on and, uh, at, the, at the paper, at the magazine, and until this one time I was sent out to Las Vegas to cover a convention. And I arrived there on a Monday or a Tuesday. I remember when I arrived, I sent Bernard a postcard just to let her know where I was. <laughs> and I came to uh, Thursday morning. My deadline was at 1 o'clock, and I didn't cover the story. And I knew I was in trouble. So what do you do when you're in trouble? You have a few drinks. I went down to the bar. I met a guy named Ed at the bar, and uh, he told me he had been at the convention. So I got a bottle, we sat at a table, I interviewed Ed. <laughs> and between what Ed thought he remembered <laughs> and what I conjured up in my own crazy mind, I wrote a story. I had some background, you know, on this organization. And they printed the story, and they got sued for three and a half million dollars. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, I, and I quit, and I got a... I, and I got a job working in the public relations business, and that lasted me six months. So I can trace the progressiveness of the disease in my job, in my, in my uh, you know, eight and a half years as a newspaper writer, three and a half as a magazine writer, and now I'm in the PR business that lasted six months. Meanwhile, at home, my mother-in-law, um, whom I came to hate with a passion, um, and then eventually came to love more than as much as anybody I've ever loved. Anyway, uh, the family lent us some money, and we bought a two-family house in Floral Park, and uh, um, they gave us a down payment. And uh, we were getting $95 rent from an upstairs apartment. This is a long time ago. 
And our mortgage payment was only $75 a month. And I couldn't keep up the payments. <laughs> so um, I, one day I was coming home. I had no money, you know. And um, so I passed by this window, a do- storefront. It said Beneficial Finance Company. And there was a guy standing behind the counter with a big smile. So I walked in and said hello. You know, <laughs> told him I was running short. And before you know it, I just signed a piece of paper and he lent me $50. And it got me over, you know, it got me through. But then they went 30 days later, they wanted a payment, and I didn't have the money. So I went over to the household, and I borrowed 100, and I paid them back to 50. And then the payment was due. And I had a night city editor named Joe McGovern, who had a friend at uh, local loan, and um, he said, I'll sign a note for you at local if you'll sign one for me at household. I said, fine, Joe. So I, I borrowed 400 from local, and I paid everybody back. And I thought I found the key to financial success, you know. <laughs> and I don't know about you guys and gals, but when I finally sobered up, I owed four finance companies, two banks, two loan sharks, and my Aunt Jenny. And the only one that was born in the weight was Aunt Jenny. You know? Everybody else wanted their payments. Um, and I'd like to share this story before I forget it, because... Um, God does work in very, very strange ways in Alcoholics Anonymous. We were just talking about that. Um, I had a loan shark named Richie Baldino, which I think is a wonderful name for a loan shark. Richie Baldino. <laughs> Richie was a big, heavy set guy, and he walked with a limp and carried a stick, and I'm not making that up. It's true. I met him in the rain house. <laughs> and he had his own book, meaning, you know, he... He claimed he wasn't connected, but you know, that was just so that we'd feel more comfortable, you know. <laughs> he was connected. Anyway, um, so I started borrowing from Richie. And I, and I, I don't know how much I borrowed, but when I sobered up, I owed him $17,500. Now, I know I didn't borrow him. I probably borrowed about eight grand. But, but you know, the vigorish, you know, the, the, they call it interest. <laughs> the vigorish. And, um, and so Richie kept after me. He wanted, my, he wanted his money. Otherwise, you know what? I was sober about three weeks when um, I heard Richie died of a heart attack. And I said to my sponsor, I owe this guy $17,500. Benny, what do I do? He said, pray for him. Uh (laughs) So if you are sitting here today with a major problem facing you in your life, Turn it over to God. He'll find a way to work it out. He'll probably even check in with Richie to find out. You know. <laughs> so this is my prayer. I always, I always bring this up because it's my prayer for Richie Baldino. Anyway, getting back to... We finally had to sell the house in, in Floral Park to pay off all the debts. We bought a house out in Deer Park, Long Island. We had to sell that in 10 months because the bank was about to take it back. No, the bank did take it back. And we moved into my mother-in-law's basement in uh, Richmond Hill, Queens. My mother-in-law was a, was a um, wonderful Italian lady, about five foot two, and, um, and she was always praying. Now, we lived in the basement, and she would always sit in her dining room. And when I say my mother-in-law was always praying, um, she had the New Testament and the Old Testament. She had a stack of prayer cards like that, a book of the saints, and two sets of rosary beads. And I'd pray it, I think, you know. To get to the basement, you had to go in the side door, past the dining room, down the stairs. And every time I would come home, you know, drunk, which was most of the time, my mother would be sitting there praying. And I knew she was praying for me. And I would scream at her, stay out of my life. Stay out of my damn life. I don't need you in my life. Why don't you shut the hell up? And she'd just keep on praying. Keep on praying. Anyway, um... This was around 1961. I wound up in the public relations business. We wound up in the basement. I was very sick physically, mentally, physically, and spiritually. Uh, God and I had parted company uh, because these, uh, you know, the, the prayers helped me this time and I won't do it again. But now like sawdust in my mouth. Um, I knew my wife hated my guts. My children were afraid of me. I weighed about 310 pounds. I'd never been a lightweight, but this was, I really ballooned up. In fact, on, on 47th Street, where I also drank, they, 
I was known as the moon, you know. They see me walk in the joint, you know, big and round. They say, hey, look, at the moon is out tonight. Oh, you know. But what was happening to me inside, aside from outside, was I was beginning to get really scared. Really scared and, and really confused and bewildered. I would sit at bars on 3rd Avenue in New York, sawdust on the floor, and wondering what the hell is going on in my life. I drank up a wonderful job at the Journal, a wonderful job at this magazine, a wonderful job in PR, and, and, and here I am, and I got nothing. And, and so I came to the conclusion that I was crazy. You know, for an alcoholic, being crazy makes a lot of sense. At least for me it did. It explained away all the things that I did and was doing over and over again, things I didn't want to do, the trouble I was getting into. Um, and so one night, I got a call from Bernadette. I was somewhere. I forget where. Yeah, okay. And uh, somewhere. And uh, she, she reached me through some friends because one of our daughters was ill. So I met her at the hospital, put the baby in the hospital. And on the way home, back to the basement, she, uh, we stopped at some place to eat. And um, she said, I ordered seven drinks. She ordered something to eat. And she looked at me. And, uh, you know, I didn't mind Bernard screaming and hollering. You know, I accepted that because I was a no good SB and all the things I was calling myself. The thing I hated the most when she, was, when she would look at me in those weak moments and say to me, what are you doing to yourself? Why are you doing this to yourself? And then she said it this day in the restaurant. And I started to cry. And these were not crocodile tears this time. And of course I was scared. And I said, Bernadette, I think I'm going crazy. I, just, I don't know what else. I'm just going nuts. I'm going crazy. Now you shouldn't really say that to someone like Bernadette, you know, because she's a lady of action, you know. <laughs> she's not just a listener, you know. She, she really believes you do something about it. So she called our family doctor who said, I can't help him because he's a drunk like his father. But she said, he said, maybe he needs to see a psychiatrist. So he gave her the name of a psychiatrist. And the following Saturday afternoon, I found myself sitting in front of Dr. John Broncato, a psychiatrist in Richmond Hill, Queens, and um, made an appointment. And I was ready. I stopped at Fred Funk's on the way to, you know, and had a few, and I was ready to meet this guy. It's a very, very big, you know, deal to see a psychiatrist because I really wanted this guy to help me. You know, just tell me what was wrong, I'd do what he told me to do, and I'd be fine. You know? I always liked it that way, you know, short and sweet. So I sat there, I put my belly on his desk, you know, and um, <laughs> looked at him straight in the eye. He told me later on I looked like Porky Pig with a hangover, you know. <laughs> he didn't have a very good bedside manner, this guy, you know. And he said, why are you here? I said, uh, because I think I'm going crazy, or I am crazy, or something, you know. And he said, tell me why. And I began to share with him, talk with him, tell him some of the things that I was doing, you know, the trouble I was getting into. And I remember I told him I came to on a subway train, you know, and I, I thought I was all by myself. until I looked up, and the, pli the, the train was packed with people, except they were over there, and I was here, and they were staring at me like I was some kind of an animal. Of course, I was covered with puke from my chin down to my knees, you know. <laughs> So I get up, I ran out of the subway train and upstairs and down up the street and to, I had to find a bar to wash up because only, you know, only bars have you know, places where you can wash up, you know. And, um, oh, and then he said, to me, oh, you drink, huh? I said, yeah. I said, oh, yeah, I have a, a few now and then. You know? <laughs> and he said, well, tell me what you mean by a few. Is that you know, a few beers with the boys on weekends? I said, yeah, that's what I have, a few beers with the boys on weekends. Do you ever drink beer during a week, like on a Monday or a Tuesday? I said, yeah. How about a Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday? I said, yeah. He said, well, do you ever drink anything else from beer? you ever drink any rye? I said, yeah. Do you, you ever drink any scotch? I said, yeah. Do you ever drink any gin? I said, yeah. Do you ever drink any vodka? I said, yeah. Do you, you ever drink any wine? I said, well, I don't drink Christian Brothers Sherry wine. You know, I, uh, I, I, I gave that up, you know. Yeah. But this guy, this guy was trying to paint a picture of a guy who was 27 years old, who drank every day in the week, anything he could get his hands on. And then he looked at me. I didn't know going in that this guy had been a colonel in the Air Force and who knew all about alcoholism. God had brought me to the right place. I had no idea. Anyway, um, he said to me, Bill, do you know that I knew, right? 
And he said to me, Bill, that's an alcoholic, but that's an alcoholic in the final stages of his disease. He said he wasn't born there. He said through the use and abuse of alcohol, he wound up down there. And he said, might have been born in a nice place like you. He said, let me tell you about alcoholism. And he began to talk to me about the disease of alcoholism. And suddenly, I began to get an inkling that this guy was suggesting that I was an alcoholic. <laughs> and I got ticked off. I mean, I mean, I remember sitting in Fred Funk's getting ready for this meeting, you know, and, and saying to myself, I'm going to be as honest as the guys can because I really want help. But now he says, I, I, I came to him out of the goodness of my heart, right? And now he's beginning to insult me, calling me a damn alcoholic, you know. It was like a plexiglass thing came down between us, and his lips kept moving, but I wasn't hearing, you know. And the last thing I heard when it went back up was, if you are an alcoholic, I can't help you. And, and I sort of kind of felt down about that. And he said, but I know some people who can. And he went through his roll of decks, and he wrote down a number, and he handed it to me. And it was the New York Intergroup Office of Alcoholics Anonymous. And he said, if you want help, call these people. He said, but if you're not sure, he says, no sense coming back to see me. Of course, it cost $25 a visit. This was in 1961. And if you want to keep on drinking, Bill, you're going to need the money. <laughs> he was very straight, very straight guy. <laughs> so now I had to go back, you know, into our basement and try to explain to Bernadette what this doctor said to me, because I knew he was going to call her. So I said, Bernadette, I said, you got to understand. Uh, she was sitting on one cot. I was sitting on the other cot. So we slept on two cots behind the oil burner in the basement, and the uh, kids slept around the wall in cribs. And uh, it was a you know, lovely abode. Anyway, um, she said, what did the doctor say? I said, he said, I, he thinks I'm an alcoholic. She said, what? <laughs> he thinks I'm an alcoholic. But I said, quickly, you got to understand what he means by an alcoholic. She said, well, tell me. I said, well, he said, an alcoholic is usually someone who is very intelligent. <laughs> true, right? True, right? But, you, but somebody who is very emotional, you know, and somebody who is very sensitive. And what happens, he said, is when an alcoholic gets upset, they have to reach for a drink. So he told me to tell you to stop yelling at me from now on. <laughs> and to tell your damn mother to lay off me, too, you know. So Remember that... Uh, Exorcist, you know, the head spinning around. That was burning its head. <laughs> going around, yeah. She said, well, what are you going to do? I said, uh, I'm going to go to New York. I'm going to talk to these people. So I went over to New York. Walked in there. There's a guy on the desk um, named John. But, you know, a volunteer for the day, you know, answering phones. And I walked in, and, and he said to me, I, uh, you have a problem with alcohol? I said, no, but there's a psychiatrist back in Queens that thinks I do. And he sent me over here for some information, you know. He said, oh, okay, fine. He said, um, uh, would you like to go to an AA meeting? So I said, yeah, I guess so. Uh, I think it, you, you sign up like maybe a week from Tuesday or something, you know. Yeah. So I said, yeah, okay, fine, John. And he said, how about tonight? I said, tonight? Huh. <laughs> this is Saturday night. No, I'm busy tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I had nothing to do but drink, you know. So he handed me his card and he said to me, that's all right. And he said, anytime you want to go to a meeting, call me up and I'll take you. I said, thank you, John. And what did this card? And this is true. I'm, I'm back. You can't make this stuff up, not even in movies. It said, John so-and-so, vice president of Chase Manhattan Bank. And I was running short, you know. <laughs> so I said, where would you like to go, John? <laughs> so John took me out to Garden City, Long Island, you know, which is a very high-class neighborhood, you know. And it's Saturday night in this white church, everybody's all dressed up. Back in those days, we saw it. Them Saturday nights in AA, you get all dressed up. And, uh, and I'm hiding the, 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 the shirt on my back on my only pants, you know. <laughs> and John says, sit down and put me in a front row. Damn. Front row. We, we, really, we really are mean to newcomers, you know. <laughs> and he says, just relax, you're going to hear an alcoholic speak. Just try to identify with him. So this little skinny guy gets up. I mean, guys, I mean, you know, a stiff breeze would have blown him over, you know. How can I identify with him? I weigh 310 pounds. This guy weighs 150 soaking wet, you know. And then he starts to talk. He was a retired detective. Drank himself off the job. And uh, then was Joe. First guy I ever heard speak in AA, and he's still today one of my closest friends. Isn't that fantastic? I, mean, I love this guy. He's... And he was a lawyer. And he, and he was told a story about uh, troubles at home, automobile wrecks, lost jobs, and I'm sitting there saying to myself, how not going to happen to anybody, for God's sake, you know? You don't have to be an alcoholic for that to happen to you. Yeah, 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 you know. 
After the meeting, they surrounded me, and they said to me, where do you live? We want to give you what your home group is. They had a book, you know, a meeting book. I said, I live in Richmond Hill. Oh, your meetings are on Tuesdays and Saturdays. Well, I couldn't tell them I wasn't going to go to Richmond Hill, where I lived. Hell, I don't want anybody to see me going to AA, you know. Never thought about the fact that 3 o'clock on Saturday afternoons, they see me urinating on their hedges, you know. <laughs> but uh, see me going to AA, oh, you know. So. so in three miles out of my way, to the Woodhaven group. And I stayed around long enough. I gave it a good shot. I don't know about anybody here, but if you're still thinking, yeah, I can help cut it short for you. I sat there and I compared myself to everybody who had done something that I hadn't done. <laughs> and back then, I was the youngest guy by probably 15 or 20 years in the Woodhaven group, 1961. Excuse me. Anyway, make a long story short, I came back to the basement one night after a meeting after about two and a half months. Didn't I give it that much time? Two and a half months? And I didn't drink that much during that time, right? No. Um, not that much, anyway. So anyway, <laughs> I said to Bernie, I'm very glad I went to Alcoholics Anonymous. And she lit up. She said, yeah, good. Well, yeah. And I said, yeah. Because I learned in AA that if I ever kept on drinking the way I was drinking, someday I could have a lot of trouble. <laughs> oh. And here she's looking around. She's sitting on a cot behind an old burner. And she's saying, what the hell is this? <laughs> She says, well, what are you going to do now? I said, I'm just going to drink beer. <clears throat> <laughs> I didn't know how sick I was. I didn't know how sick I was. And uh, she, didn't, she didn't know how sick I was either. We didn't, didn't know about this thing. You know? Anyway, I drank beer that night, drank beer the next night. Then all of a sudden the beer got up to here and I had to get it down with something and I was off to the races. And on April 7th, 1962, I found myself sitting on a window ledge uh, in New York, a uh, hotel window ledge at the Margarita Hotel, which is now right across the street from the 22nd Street Station House. It used to be there. Yeah. And uh, it was an air shaft in between buildings. I'm on the eighth floor, and I decided that at 28 my life was over because I just looked myself in the mirror. I just crawled off a mattress, and I was filled with puke and stink. And anyway, I, uh, I decided I was going to kill myself. But I, but I looked down the air shaft, and there were a lot of these telephone lines crisscrossing the air shaft, you know, all the way down. And I couldn't find a clear spot. I was afraid if I jumped, I'd like to hit a wire on the way down and hurt myself, you know. So, uh, and I found out that I didn't want to kill myself. I didn't want to die. None of us want to die. I just didn't know how to live. And when we come in here, we don't know how to live. And I wanted to... I wanted something. I didn't know what. I just had it. We have a young guy in our group named Matt who shared the other night that he doesn't know whether he said his bottom or not. That was my bottom. And the fact that Matt's here is his bottom. Can be. I hope it is. Anyway, I got a six-pack and uh, had a few drinks and I came home to leave my wife for good. She'd be better off without me, you know, pack up my suitcase, get out of her life, blah, 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 get on welfare, whatever, you know, all that kind of self-pity crap. Except this time, Bernard didn't scream and holler at me. And she just looked at me and she said, before you leave, do you think you owe me one last favor? And I said, I guess so. She says, for God's sake, Bill, why don't you give AA another try? And I thought this woman hated me. And uh, I thanked Bernard for that. Anyway, but I had to go out and have a few drinks to think about it. <laughs> I had a few drinks down the bar under the L on Liberty Avenue. I came back, took a shower in my mother-in-law's apartment, put on the white boss bathrobe, and sat there trying to figure out what I was going to do. And a guy called me. Bernard had called somebody. And the guy called me back. His name was Joe. And Joe said, I hear you having trouble again, Bill. Would you like to come back to Alcoholics Anonymous? And my higher power said yes because I didn't know what to do. And the following night, April 8th, 1962, Joe and Johnny Grimes and Jimmy Bagan, Benny Michelson, came and picked me up and brought me back to the Woodhaven Group of Alcoholics Anonymous. And through the grace of God, I haven't found it necessary to take a drink since. But... <laughs> but I wanted to drink more than I wanted to breathe because we all know what it's like 
coming into Alcoholics Anonymous with a ton of baggage. I have, I owed, I think it was a $57,000 in debt, living in a basement, a car up on bricks, blocks, because I, every time I got whatever it was, $26 to get it registered, I got drunk. I was, I was unemployable, nobody wanted to hire me, I had a bad reputation in my industry. And, uh, and here you want me to face all that without a drink. Man, alive. How do I do it? And then he said, you do it with us. You do it with us. We don't do it alone. We do it together. And I'm here to help you. We're here to help you. And Benny became my sponsor, Benny Michelson, Jewish jeweler from Brooklyn. Fantastic guy. He was a guy that I probably would never drank with at a bar, you know. But there was something very special about Benny, and I wanted what he had. And he brought me in, after the meeting, he brought me into the kitchen. Back in those days, we had coffee mugs. We didn't have styrofoam cups. And we had to wash them. We had to wash them in the ashtrays. You know, and you can stay sober washing coffee mugs because it's, you know, service. You can't stay sober washing styrofoam cups, you know. <clears throat> and, uh, and I began to go wherever Benny went. I was afraid to go out by myself. I was much more comfortable laying on that cot with the shades down and hoping the world would go away. So I began to spend time in Benny's shop, in Benny's jewelry store. He was, he was sitting in the back repairing watches, and I would sit on a stool next to him, and he would talk AA. And he began to give me hope. He began to give me hope that things in my life could change. And uh, I was sober about, uh, about a month, I guess. Um, and uh, we had moved from the basement with the people upstairs that my mother-in-law's house moved out. We moved up into a three-room apartment. You know, four kids, wife and me in a four-room apartment, but it was like paradise. And one day, I went out looking for a job, and I got a lot of doors slammed in my face. And by the time I got back home, I was really in a deep depression, very upset, very, 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 very down, very bewildered. And uh, there was a big chocolate cake on the table. You say it was something else. I still say it was a chocolate cake. In my mind, it's a chocolate. Yeah, okay. But anyway, it was a cake, and I wanted a piece. And I said, can I have a piece of that cake? And she said, no. I, by this time, by the way, Bernadette was in Al-Anon. My sponsor's wife got her into Al-Anon. And she said, no, I baked that for Al-Anon. First resentment, boop. <clears throat> I said, but I'd like a piece of that cake. I'm sorry, but I baked that for Al-Anon. So I said, oh, yeah. And I went over to the refrigerator because I knew there were three cans of beer that my brother-in-law had left in the refrigerator. But I had forgotten that I had asked Bernadette as my sponsor. They asked me to ask her to never keep anything around to drink. And she had taken it and she had hid it in the closet. I said, where's the damn beer? Don't you trust me? And she got it out of the closet and she threw it at me. And I said to her, you're going to be sorry. You're going to regret this. And I sat down in the little living room we had and popped open a can of beer. And I was just about to drink it. And the phone rang. And the phone rang and it was a guy named Eddie Moylan calling me up to go on a 12-step call with him. And so help me God, it's like I was there today. And um, the beer dropped out of my hand and I started to cry. Because my sponsor had just gotten me down on my knees and asked me to ask God every morning to keep me sober. And I knew, I felt in my heart that this is God keeping me sober. And from that point on, my sobriety began to get stronger and stronger and stronger. <clears throat> and I can go on and tell you all kinds of stories about these wonderful men in the Woodhaven group particularly Benny, my sponsor, who helped me so much. Uh, Benny used to be the guy, when he would, when he would uh, talk, he'd share about the fact that he would join any group, any organization, any time, as long as they had a bar. In fact, he said he was the only Jewish member of the Italian Bocce Association of America. You know. And I, I began to open up with Benny, and Benny took me to a retreat, and went through the steps, and... And then um, I was sober uh, uh, about seven or eight months, and uh, I was offered a job in Nashville, Tennessee. It was an opportunity to, uh, to change the course of our lives, my life, and, uh, and Bernadette was generous enough to go with me. Her mother uh, always said to her that, uh, you know, I remember, I remember Bernadette telling me, and, and Mom told me later on, <clears throat> that when I was really in the depths of my disease and Bernadette wanted to leave me, my mother-in-law, who knew nothing about this disease, said to her, you can't leave him 
because he's sick and he needs you. When I was sober about five or six months and had all the answers, yeah, you know, right, and was directing the family with a baton, you know, she went to her mother and said, I really can't stand him now. <laughs> i got to leave him. She said to her, but sweetheart, you can't leave him now. Somebody else will get all the good stuff, you know. <laughs> My mother-in-law was somebody else. Oh, I see, was somebody else. I'm telling you. Anyway, just to... I, I, I'm running out of time here. So let me... I, as I began to uh, stay sober and my life began to change, we, uh, we moved to Nashville, Tennessee. And um, uh, then he said to me, go to Nashville first, make sure they got AA in Nashville. Of course, this is in 1962. And uh, they had two groups in Nashville right then. And um, we went to Nashville. We met wonderful people on that Saturday night meeting. And, and so he said I could take the job. And I got this job because they didn't bother checking on me. They took a friend's word that I was good at what I did. So I became the uh, head of public relations for this big corporation in Nashville, owned by the Murkison Brothers. And, and um, our life, Bernard's got an island on. We began to have more children. We got a lovely home down there. And I was very, very active in the program. And, and it was just it was absolutely fantastic. And the people that I met, I just mentioned two, because I was saying last night to somebody, at the Merino group, um, that, you know, nobody in AA ever dies. You think about it, nobody ever dies. Everybody we meet that gives us something, that something will always stay with us, and they will always stay with us. Benny will never die. Jimmy Bagan will never die. Johnny Grimes, Joey, they'll never die. Charlie Howe, a pig farmer from Nashville, Tennessee, used to stand up at a meeting and say, we all come into AA like big jugs of dirty water. And he said, if we only un empty half of the jug out and refill it, we're still going to be big jugs of dirty water. He said, what we have to do is we come into AA, we empty the whole jug. We clean the jug out. And then one day at a time, we refill it drop by drop until one day we're jugs of crystal clear water. And you're looking at a half pint right now. So. <laughs> I love Charlie Howe. Charlie Howe used to say that he used to get so drunk that he'd come home and the wife wouldn't let him in the house and he'd call into the pigsty and the pigs would leave, you know. <laughs> W.A. Boyd, who could not speak a sentence that had l words of more than two syllables, <laughs> but had a great AA program. And he used to stand up and he would say, if you take AA in one hand and God in the other, it'll take you on the greatest ride you've ever been on. Yeah, right. One night at a Christmas party at Cherry Carpenter's house in Nashville, W.A. came over to me and he said, I got a bad report from the doctor today. I said, what's wrong? He said, this cancer I got. I said, I didn't even know you had it. He said, ah, it's no big deal. He says, but they give me about six or eight months. Like he was telling me he had a cold. And then W.A. taught me how to face terrible tragedies in my life. Things that we don't want to accept. He told me how to accept them because I was with W.A. all the way down from 185 to 76 pounds. We used to carry him to meetings on the chair. When it got too painful, we'd bring the meeting to his home. We'd lay in bed and just simply smile because he had, wasn't strong enough to do anything else. And then we buried him. And W.A. Boyd will never die. All of you, from Mariah Harrison, Mamaronek, Larchmont, I mean, Connecticut, Porchester, where I spent so much time. I was in Ray Harrison Group for 21 years. Spent many, much, many meetings. Of, you'll never die. You, well, first of all, you're all here alive right now. <laughs> but I thank you. I thank you. I thank you for keeping me sober. For giving me what I have today. Now I'm going to close because I want to just take a, whatever time. I hope I have a few minutes left to share with you my God story. Tim mentioned that I was privileged to write a movie called My Name is Bill W. Um, but how that came about, that's my God story. I came back from, from Nashville to Cleveland, Ohio, where I lived a couple of years. I had another wonderful job. Came back to New York, started my own company. And um, these are all the things that happen in Alcoholics Anonymous, the fringe benefits. And um, 
1972, I got together with three other fellows, uh, and we started a, uh, a film company. It's actually a talent management and film production company in New York. Um, one, of them, one of them had a big, been a big agent in the theatrical business. Number one, another one was the top booker in Las Vegas, and the other one was an insurance man <laughs> who wrote insurance for Elliot Gould and Bob Streisand, so he was with the right people. Anyway, we put together a company. A, a friend of mine who was an investment banker raised the money, and we started a company called Artist Entertainment Complex, and uh, we started managing talent, and uh, we made the first movie we made was called Kansas City Bomber. I know nobody. <laughs> Don't jump up and down. Anyway, um, <clears throat> It was, it was way back then about the roller derby, and it starred Raquel Welch. It plays TV once in a while. But to watch Raquel Welch skating around in tight-fitting leather pants is like having a spiritual awakening. <laughs> then another newspaper friend of mine who I'd covered the Knapp Commission with, a guy named Peter Morse. Um, Knapp Commission was the investigation of dirty cops in New York, and, and uh, there's a guy named Servico who was a test, testified against cops. Frank Sebaco, and then um, they tried to kill him a couple of times. Anyway, he fled to Switzerland, and my friend uh, Peter, who had been a reporter for the Herald Tribune when I was with the Journal American, he went over and he got Frank's rights to write a book about it, came back, we had lunch one day, and he said, this would make a great movie, and so we put a deal together with Dino De Laurentiis, to make a long story short, we made a movie called Servico, and, um, which was a, a nice movie. And... Um, we would sit in our offices, the four of us, and talk about ideas, you know. And, uh, three of them would drink martinis, and I'd drink my Coca-Cola, you know. And, um, and then one, one guy came back from California with a, a tear-out from Life magazine. It was a story about a, a guy who robbed a bank in Brooklyn to get enough money to get his boyfriend a sex change operation. He said, I think it make a great movie. I said, oh, yeah, it ain't my cup of tea. But anyway, we made it. It was called Dog Day Afternoon. So. And... Um, then it, became, then it became my turn, and I said, uh, I got a great idea. By this time, my wife had introduced me to Lois Wilson. And I just say that because that's what happened. Okay? And we were very fortunate enough uh, that over the years we got to know Lois really well. We were good friends with Lois for probably over 14 years of her, of her life. And, um, and Lois was awfully sweet to us. In fact, she used to come down to the house with Christmas and Thanksgiving and you, got, you kids gave her that cat, which he named Borchi, right? And uh, which is wonderful. And so I, I, I thought I'd like to make a movie about her and Bill. So I thought the story of AA was fantastic. And, and so I asked her one day if I could have her permission. And so she turned to Bernadette and she said, can he really write? You know, so <laughs> Bernadette assured her, so we got her rights. And so at the, one of these office meetings, I said to my partners, I got a hell of an idea. I'd like to make a movie about Alcoholics Anonymous. And as they sit there, Martini <laughs> nah, I don't think so. Nah, I don't think so. <laughs> and by that time, we were having some problems, ego problems, you know. Everybody wanted to go in a different direction, so we broke up. And, um, and I decided that I was going to make this movie. Because by this time, Bill was really on a roll. I mean, his ego was back in spades. His character DFX were out there flying. I know Bernard doesn't like to hear this part, but I used to hire limousines to pick up my friends from the brown town. And we'd arrive at Saudi's and pass out cigars and we'd go to the fights and all this big shot stuff. You know, mm-hmm. let them know what I... And I'd sit there and drink my Coke as they drank all of their booze. And Man, I was really a... <clears throat> so now, top of all this, I'm going to make a movie to save the world. And they'll really know what a great 12-stepper I am. <laughs> anyway, God had other ideas. Um, I wrote the script, like Tim said, and then I tried to sell it. And uh, uh, In fact, uh, Peter Goober, who was at that time the head of Columbia, wanted to do it with me. Like he said, he remember, we went, he invited us out. We spent the weekend with him and went over and sent us over to Vegas for a week. And it was really wonderful. And he uh, got back very excited. He had read the script. And he said, I really want to make this movie, but we've got to make some changes. I said, what do you want to change? He said, well, this guy, Bill Wilson, we, I mean, he's a great drunk. And great drunks chased naked broads up and down hotel rooms and, you know, through the streets. I mean, we've we got to get some excitement into this. I said, Peter, this is a spiritual movie. He said, oh, I don't make spiritual movies. They suck, you know. <laughs> so I, I, I had given Lois 
my word that we would tell the truth of the story and so we, in spite of anyway I didn't make it with him and came back to New York and by this time I had pumped a lot of personal finances into it and uh, as Bernard well recalls and I decided I had to put it on a back shelf and uh, go to work again so I started another communications company and uh, put out a side now my God story I used to spend a lot of time up at the Casa Serena Joe LaPiccolo's place remember Jack a great guy you probably remember him right? wonderful I used to oh, the spaghetti dinners up there fantastic and so I began to sponsor guys up at Joe's place, and I loved it up there because I realized that I was this close to getting drunk from that ego trip, and um, and I needed to get back in this program. And in fact, my sponsor said, "You better get that back in this program." So I did. And so I, I got the good friends with the cook. There's a cook up there named Ed, and Ed and I became very close friends. And Ed was about to celebrate his first anniversary, and we began to talk a lot. Ed and I, you know, and I shared everything with him. He shared everything with me. And so I spoke for his first anniversary. And that night, afterwards, he pulled me aside and he said, I've made a decision what I'm going to do with the rest of my life. Of course, I kept telling him to think about what he's going to have to do. He said, I decided I'm going to go to Hollywood and I'm going to become a movie star. I said, hey, hey I think that's great, Ed. Uh, I mean, Ed was about six foot two. Uh, he had a broken nose. He had a lip that curled, I mean, a knee that curled up, you know, a couple of scars on his face. You know, the... Typical movie star type, you know. And uh, so I said, Ed, I wish you lots of luck, but when you get out there, make sure you get into AA. There was a lot of AA meetings. He said, oh, yeah, fine. And he said, by the way, can I take that script of yours with me just in case I bump into somebody that might, might want to do it? So I said, sure, Ed. <laughs> Here's my script. So I gave him my script. And, and off he goes to Hollywood. I didn't think much of it, except I hope he stayed sober until we're starting to watch, we're watching TV. And all of a sudden, one night, I see Archie Bunker, and two cops show up at Archie Bunker's house. And you know who one of the cops is? Ed. I said, holy mackerel. You know, this guy is really a hustler. Another night, I'm watching Fred Sanford and Sons, you know, the junkyard show, right? Two firemen arrive because there's a fire in the junkyard. You know who one of the firemen is? Ed. Yeah. Ed's going around to all the producers, knocking on their doors, finding out what they're doing, you know, and, and getting their auditions. And he's getting his little parts. Then one day I get a call from Ed, and he's on the phone. He's very, very angry. And he's really up, and he's upset. And he says, Bill, they're trying to steal your movie out here. I said, what the hell are you talking about, Ed? He said, I, they're, they're, some company's trying to make a movie about Alcoholics Anonymous. I said, well, anybody can do that, you know. He said, oh, but you got permission, blah, blah, blah. I said, Ed, calm down. Anybody can do that. What had happened was, he had knocked on the door of a company called Garner Show, James Garner and Peter Show Associates, and um, found out that they were trying to make a movie about Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, they were trying to do it with the Warner Brothers and Hallmark Hall of Fame. And they had been through five writers, and none of them could come up with a script that they liked. And so Ed gave my script to Mary Ann, James Garner's secretary. And she took it home and read it, and she loved it. And so she sent it over to Jim. And Jim read it. Now, Jim thought that Bill Borchardt was another writer that his partner, Peter Duchot, had hired. So he reads it and he likes it and he calls Peter. And he says, Peter, this new guy you got to write this new script, it's a great job, love it, congratulations. And Peter said, who the hell is Bill Borchardt? Never heard of him. He said, well, somehow I got this script. Mary Ann got it. Peter says, well, we're in trouble. We're reading somebody's script and we don't have this permission. He says, well, Jim says, well, get in touch with him because I really like his script. That Saturday, Bernard and I are sitting in the kitchen in Rye on Grandview Avenue. We just finished lunch. And a telephone rings. And there's Peter Duchot, gone as partner. And he says, Bill, Bill Borcher, I said, yeah. He said, I'm a producer in California and I'm in trouble because I read a script of yours without your permission. Well, we've been trying to make a movie about Alcoholics Anonymous and about Bill Wilson and so on and so forth. And he said, we love your script. But we're trying to do it for Hallmark Hall of Fame, which is a two-hour TV movie, and you wrote it as a feature. Would you be willing to rewrite it for television? I said, I don't know, but you're kind of busy right now. But if you give me about ten minutes, you know. And that's how it happened. When I wanted to do it, God wasn't ready. Because I probably would have got drunk, you know saving everybody in the world. I would have got drunk. Big shot. 
So when God felt I had enough humility to be able to handle it, he said, okay, now's the time. And he introduced me to Ed. And Ed the cook took my script to California and <laughs> bumped into somebody, secretary, who passed it on to Garner, passed it on to Pete, and Pete called me. And that's how it happened. That's my God story. It couldn't have happened any other way. It taught me again that things happen at God's time. So if you want them to happen now and they're not, it's just not God's time. It will happen. In closing, I want to get back to my mother-in-law. Because over the years, Mom and I became very good friends. Um, this was a woman who saw what I had done to her daughter and to her grandchildren through my use and abuse of alcohol. Didn't understand, but kept praying. And through her prayers, I found my way into Alcoholics Anonymous. One night, uh, one, Mama used to come down and spend time with us in Nashville when we were having, Bernard was having more children. She would help her, you know. And um, this one night, Bernard and the kids had gone to bed. I was getting ready to do some writing, and Mama was getting ready to do some praying. And she comes into the den, and I'm sitting there on the couch, and she sits next to me. And she puts her arm on my shoulder. And she says, you know, Bill, all of these years, I've been reading the life of Jesus Christ and all the miracles that he did. And I read the lives of these saints and all the miracles that he did. And she said, I've often wondered what it would be like to see a miracle. And then she looked up at me and she said to me, and now I have. She saw the miracle of Alcoholics Anonymous. And if you were standing up here right now in my shoes and looking out what I see out here, you would also see the miracle of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I thank you for sharing it with me. Thank you.